Let me open our time in a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the great privilege, again, of having your word. You have spoken, and that ought to be enough for us. We long to enter into reading our Bibles as your very words, breathed out by you. Uh, We thank you for the rich treasure it is to be able to know your mind and your heart, to know your expectations for our lives, but um, really importantly, to know how to get to heaven, to be in your presence, to know how to have our sins forgiven. Lord, we thank you that you have provided the way, the only way, through your Son. And all of this to give us access to you, that we might know you, uh, that we might love you, that we might bring you glory. We pray even as we reflect on what it means that you have spoken and that we must heed your words and your words alonely, uh, only as our final authority, that you would be pleased in, in all that we do. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So the theme of this series is speaking for God, and my purpose is twofold. One, to cause us to have great fear about speaking for God, uh, for fear of getting it wrong, misrepresenting Him, uh, maligning His character, maligning His thoughts, and yet to have great boldness to speak for God, because we must speak truth to one another. We must proclaim truth. We are His ambassadors on this earth until the King returns. And so we must speak for God. So uh, to have a fear of speaking for God in in a right sense and great boldness to speak for God with courage. And and I know we're still weeks away from getting to some great helps for how to speak for God. I just want to give you a little preview of what's on my heart in that. Um, You do not have to know something exhaustively to know it truly. Do you know what I mean by that? A six-year-old can accurately represent God's heart and God's word, even if the six-year-old doesn't know everything there is to know or say everything that could be said. You don't have to know something or speak something exhaustively to speak it truly. Um, and, And God is very kind and patient with us. We are all growing, we're all students. As we learn to speak God's words, uh, we are always refining. The bottom line for us is we must come with faith in God's word as the authority and with a sincerity and reverence that draws us to always be refining our thoughts and our proclamations to his word. It just means we have to be humble and teachable. We're all going to be learning in this process. So. I want to begin uh, this morning again by simply reading this section from Psalm 19. You can turn in your Bible. And the second half of Psalm 19 deals with what we call special revelation or God's written word. And that is different from the general revelation. And what have I done with my glasses? I have no idea. Tom's got readers back there. What are they, Tom? They're for 70-year-olds. I'm getting close. Oh, this is really embarrassing. Janet? Okay, thank you. Actually, these, these work well. Okay, thanks, Janet. Our aged eyes are close. Close enough, anyway. All right, Psalm 19 Uh, Verses 7 to 11 details uh, not just what God has said, uh, declaring by his creative work in the universe, but what God has said in his word. And, And here's the word's testimony about itself. The law of Yahweh is perfect, restoring the soul, verse 7. The testimony of Yahweh is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of Yahweh are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of Yahweh is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of Yahweh is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of Yahweh are true. They are righteous altogether. More desirable than gold, yes, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. There's nothing like the Bible. Nothing else can match this test. Now my wife can read her Bible, and I can read my Bible. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate that. Nothing matches the Scriptures. 
Nothing can compete with its power. Nothing else is theopneustos or breathed out by God himself. Nothing else has the authority. Nothing else has the surgical precision that the word of God has in the lives of God's people. And we've been talking about some ways that the word of God is obscured and particularly obscured by addition. When we add to God's words, Uh, we actually take away from God's truth. And we do so by piling on other ideas. We talked uh, at length last week about the warnings against false prophecy. What do false prophets do? They have a vision, they have a dream, they have an impression, uh, they have an impulse, and they say that God has spoken when God hadn't spoken. And the effects of that were disastrous in the nation of Israel. I want us to consider some of the warnings that God gives about adding to his word. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 4. And verse 2. Deuteronomy 4.2 says this, You shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it that you may keep the commandments of Yahweh your God, which I command you. And in Deuteronomy 12, 32, we have a similar refrain. Whatever I command you, you shall be careful to do. You shall not add to nor take away from it. Now notice very carefully that Deuteronomy 12, 32 is not the last verse of your Bible. Did you notice that? in the book of Deuteronomy. There's a lot of books after it. There are a lot of verses after it. So what is this verse saying? Don't add to the Bible. And then there's another verse right after it. What do we do with that? Well, of course, the answer to that is simple. God can add to his word. God is progressing his revelation. The prohibition is against men adding to God's word. Right? You have the same prohibition in Proverbs 30, verse 6. Do not add to his words, or he will reprove you, and you will be proved a liar. Okay, this is a very severe prohibition. Jeremiah 26, 2 says similarly, Thus says Yahweh, stand in the court of Yahweh's house and speak to all the cities of Judah who have come to worship in Yahweh's house all the words that I have commanded you. Do not omit a word. Okay, there's the other side of the coin. Um, preach the whole counsel of God's word, essentially. Uh, don't take anything away. Don't add, don't take away. And then the Bible does close with these verses, Revelation 22, 18, and 19. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues written in the book. And if anyone takes away from the words of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city, which are written in this book. Uh, That prohibition specific probably to the book of Revelation, but interesting that the revelation of God closes at that point, ending with that sobering warning. God is serious about his words. Any more than you and I enjoy other people adding to our words, taking away our words, misrepresenting our thoughts, God is not happy when others do that with his words. We don't add, we don't take away. These are clear prohibitions in Scripture. And what I want to do this morning is is think in terms of groups, people, leaders, cults, religions of the world that have done this very thing, that that claim to speak to God, uh, that claim to speak for God, but they claim to do so on the basis of adding other authorities, adding other words. And this, I think, falls under the banner of these prohibitions in Scripture. Do not add to my words. We can think, first of all, about the Latter-day Saints, the Mormons. And you know, the Mormons have several other books besides the Bible. And and if you talk to Mormons, they will say to you, yes, you should read the Bible. And you should read Doctrines and Covenants. And you should read the Pearl of Great Price. And you should read the Book of Mormon. And if you read the Book of Mormon and you ask God to show you whether or not it it is true, in the old days they would say, God will produce for you a burning in the bosom that it is true. I think they use different phraseology now. But read these other books. And it is not outright denial that the Bible is the Word of God. But it is a denial that the Bible is the Word of God by denying its clarity and its sufficiency by saying, you need these other books too. 
and by adding these other books, violating the clear prohibitions in Scripture about adding words to God's words. So at one level, the, the five prohibitions that I just read to you from Scripture about not adding to God's words must not be true, must not be reliable, or must not be clear if, as an organization, we're adding other books. So you really can't have both the Bible and the Book of Mormon. They are mutually exclusive and contradictory. And yet that is the claim. Uh, the Bible's not enough, we've got some more. I remember very clearly sharing the gospel with a, uh, a Mormon friend. You know, it's one thing to, to try to engage in the door-to-door -door, uh, Mormon propagandists. Uh, it's another thing to have personal relationships, family, friends, where you can have long extended conversations, build a relationship, and talk to people, and really get to the heart. What do you really think? And one of my Mormon friends told me, it's just so sad, your doctrine. I'm just so brokenhearted for you. Oh, really? Well, I don't feel sad. What are you sad about? Um, and, and he said, you don't have a prophet. I'm just so sad for you that, that you don't have someone today alive on the earth who can tell you what God's word is. You see, in the, in the Mormon tradition, the president is a modern-day prophet, and he can speak God's ongoing revelation to you. Again, a violation of do not add, and a proclamation that the Bible's not enough, and for my close friend in high school, a source of his brokenheartedness over my loss at not having such a prophet. We have, of course, not just the LDS, but the FLDS. Do you know the FLDS? Uh, we have some of the fundamentalist Latter-day Saints in Colorado City, Arizona. Uh, it's, um, uh, they have decided that the, the Mormon church is apostate. Salt Lake City has gone awry. They've rejected polygamy, for instance, for political expediency, Utah statehood. You know, we, we want to be seen as mainstream and legitimate, so we'll ditch polygamy. Well, the fundamentalists said, they're off their rails. <laughs> Joseph Smith said, you have to practice polygamy or you're not going to heaven. So we do. And so there are pockets of FLDS, both in Arizona, in Utah, in Canada, and in Mexico. And interestingly, they make this claim. They make a claim of continuing revelation, what they call progressive revelation, in which the canon of Scripture is continually augmented through the sermons and the teachings of the prophets whose preaching guides the community. So they have elevated their own FLDS prophets to the level of staple this into the back of your Bible. This is additional revelation that is binding on your lives. And again, the phenomenon is whenever you add to the Bible, uh, you are making a statement about the Bible. We'll come to that in a moment. You, th you can think of the Seventh-day Adventists, um, and, and I know there's a broad spectrum of Adventists. I, I met one in Australia who told me that the Australian Adventists believe that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and we have nothing to do with the North American Adventists who believe in salvation by works. I don't know what to do with that. He was the only Australian Adventist I've ever met. Um, but you talk to Adventists here, and typically the writings of Ellen G. White and their other uh, source documents become the true authority. You can't just read your Bible, you need an interpretive grid for understanding the Bible through the Adventist lens. Of course, the JWs do the same thing, the, the Jehovah's Witnesses, um, the Watchtower Tract Society and all of their publications uh, have an endless array of authoritative documents which tell you what the Bible actually means. Islam, if you meet a Muslim who reads the Quran, he may be familiar with the, the command to read both the Old Testament and the New Testament. The, the Quran says if you're going to be a good Muslim, you have to read the Bible. But of course, the Quran is the addition to the Bible, and, and I don't know how many Muslims actually read the Old Testament and the New Testament and make a comparison. In fact, it, 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 it doesn't really get followed. The Bible is shooed away as, oh, you know, that's passed through many translations and the text has been changed. Nobody actually has the real Bible so that you could read it. So just set that aside anyway and read the Quran. That becomes the true authority. The addition actually became the replacement in Islam. 
And of course, the cults, the, the cult leaders claiming some new revelation, uh, that's usually involved with also, I, the cult leader, have the only pathway to heaven for you. And then the Roman Catholic Church is a good example of subtraction from the Word of God by obliterating addition. The Apocrypha, the intertestamental books that are not part of the Bible, that get stapled into the Bible, uh, considered scripture in Catholic dogma. Papal succession, uh, the papal statements that are made ex cathedra or out of the chair where the, the Pope is saying to the world, I am speaking directly from God, this is authoritative and binding. You have church councils and synods and the magisterium will try to define the magisterium later this morning. I'm not sure that I can. And for a Catholic, all of that is a, a big conglomeration of comfort that I know the Bible is confusing, but you can trust us. We'll just tell you what it's all about. And by doing so, the scriptures themselves, that which gives life, that which has power, that which has true authority from God, get buried. Maybe a little closer to home, we have sort of cultural Christianity, the, the detritus, the off-scouring dandruff of American Christian culture that just sort of trickles down to what we think and how we feel and how we operate. The, the kinds of phrases and things that are outside the scriptures but just sort of become the norms for how Christians behave. We gotta watch out for those. And if you're not a regular Bible reader, you will assume that the detritus is the truth, the, the stuff that just fluffs down into our collective Christian conscience. And how often do we succumb to the, the kind of generalized ideas that well, I come to my Bible and actually the clarity and precision of this text just overruled this whole idea that I have to learn to love myself if I'm gonna love others. That's like a Christian mantra right now. And it is so 180 degrees removed from the truth of the scriptures. And we just sort of absorb what is cultural norms. And maybe close to home, we, we have the, the traditions. And if you come from a denominational background, it may be those things that set apart your denomination from other denominations. This is the Methodist way. This is the Baptist way. This is the Presbyterian way. Whatever the denominational background is, this is how we do it. And that becomes authoritative and the norm. Sometimes overruling what the Bible clearly has to say on a given subject. Sometimes just elevated preferences. Those denominational norms or, or the way we've always done it. Uh, maybe just that can happen in just families. My mama always said becomes the authority rather than the Bible itself. And listen, the Bible church movement or independent local church autonomy is not free from such traditions. In fact, the longer a church exists, the more likely it can accrue those traditions, those norms, and sometimes preferences get elevated to convictions. Sometimes the regular practices get thought of as biblical. Listen, if we are a Bible church, Bible's in our middle name, Grace Bible Church, we mean it. We put the whole thing on the wall. We love the Bible. Sometimes we can assume that what we do, everything we do, is a direct correspondence to biblical conviction. Actually, the New Testament gives a lot of freedom to local ecclesiology. There are things we do, like having a quipping hour at 9 a.m. that I can't put a Bible verse on it. 10 minute or 15 minute break and then we start at 10, 15 and somebody turns the lights on and somebody unlocks the doors. We don't have Bible verses for those things but operationally we do them. If we're not careful, we can think, oh, <laughs> church I visited last week doesn't start at 10, 15. They're not biblical. Okay, that's a silly example, but think about our practice of the Lord's table. We don't do it every Sunday, but we practice it nearly every Sunday. Why? Well, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me means every week. No, it doesn't. It just says as often as you do it. Do it this way. Do it for these reasons. Why do we practice the Lord's table every week? Because we like to. Are there potential downsides to that? Sure. 
Um, but you could be tempted to think, if this is the only context you've ever been in, you go to another church and they celebrate the Lord's table once a month, once every six weeks, once a quarter, twice a year, whatever it is, none of those inherently unbiblical. And you might think, oh, they don't love Jesus? You know, we, we get our lingo, our vocabulary. We talk about shepherding our hearts. There are lots of things we talk about that are good, that reflect biblical principles. And you might walk from this church, go to another and say, well, they don't shepherd their hearts. Well, how do you know? Because they don't use that phrase. <laughs> They're unbiblical. And we just have to be careful of those things. There's a sense in which if we assume our traditions and our norms... And again, the accumulated dandruff of just, this is the way we've been doing it for the last five minutes, so it must be biblical. We just have to be careful that that doesn't replace the authority of the Word of God. Everything we do is subject to the scrutiny of God's Word. God's Word, rightly understood, can overturn any tradition, any norm, any cultural expectant, uh, uh, acceptable practice, and we have to be aware of that. And maybe close to home, again, uh, one way we can do this is just um, fill in your favorite theologian, said it, right? The Johns, uh, well, John the Baptist said it, and it was recorded in Scripture, which is true. Right? John the Apostle. But after that, John Chrysostom, you go down the list, John Calvin, John Piper, John MacArthur, John, yeah, all the Johns, John Owen, John the Edwards, said it. Well, they disagreed with each other about stuff. They're not the authority. And we can do that. My, my Reformation study Bible says so. My other named study Bible says so right here. The, those notes at the bottom are helpful commentary. They're really good. Listen, for some pastors in third world countries, that study Bible is the entire theological library that man will ever own, and he can faithfully use it to the glory of God to shepherd God's people. But still, the, the bottom, depends on the page you're on, I was gonna say the bottom two thirds of the page might be the bottom two lines. Whatever it is, the, the notes, the explanatories, they're not authoritative. They don't have the power of the living and active Word of God breathed out by God. They're helps. There's just a danger when we raise those things to the level of authority to which, um, which they do not own. Listen, any interpretive authority over the Scriptures, and we could add to this traditions, creeds, councils, confessions, suffers from this same fundamental problem. When we raise it to the elevation of, this is my authoritative grid, right? The Second Helvetic Confession of 1562, or the Westminster Confession of Faith, 1646, or the 1689 London Baptist Confession. It, those are my interpretive grid, those are my authority, that's where I do my exegesis and my hermeneutics to tell me what the Bible means. We are running into the same problem the obscuring of the scriptures by addition, a proliferation of other authorities that tell us what the Bible means. Listen, one of the slogans of the Reformation was semper reformanda, always reforming. I don't know if you've made a semper reformanda flag and sometime in October start carrying it around like a banner in your home, probably should do that. What does that mean? Always reforming. That is, the goal of the Reformation was to bring the church and the church's doctrine into conformity with the Scriptures, to bring the pattern of the church into conformity with the New Testament. The Bible is the sole authority. And what's interesting, one of the fruits of the Reformation, one of the byproducts of the Reformation, we look back to that monumental period, you know, Martin Luther, 1517, nailing 95, 95 theses to the church door of the castle uh, church at Wittenberg, and everything that came out of that. And of course, there were people who believed the gospel before Luther, and then there were a lot of things to work out after Luther, in terms of the visible church. But sometimes we look back to that era and we say, they had the answers, and Semper Reformanda has become something like always conforming to the 1600s. And at that point, you have to pick your favorite theologian and pastor from the 1600s. 
And we sort of forget that Martin Luther was a Roman Catholic for 20 years after he nailed the 95 Theses to the door. In other words, the the reformers didn't get to the bottom of Semper Reformanda. It's why they said Semper Reformanda. (laughs) In one sense, we ought to look to the reformers saying to us, take the torch, which is the Bible is the authority, and keep working. Keep doing exegesis. Keep growing. Keep learning. Always bringing the church and its doctrine into conformity with the Bible. That's the goal. The Bible's the authority, not the 1600s, 16th century and following. Otherwise, we have authority creep or interpretive creep. What I mean by that is whatever we decide is the lens through which we must see the Scriptures or understand the Scriptures actually becomes the Scriptures, it becomes the authority. And that belongs solely to the Word of God properly. Every addition to Scripture is a subtle attack on sufficiency and perspicuity. Sufficiency means the Bible is enough, and perspicuity means the Bible is clear. Uh, I'm going to use the word perspicuity only because it's in some quotes I'm going to get to in a, uh, a few moments. It's an unfortunate word. It's a big, convoluted academic word that just means clear. Okay, why do we have to use a confusing word to say clear? I don't know. It's going to slip out a few times. Just know perspicuity means clarity. We're talking about the doctrine of perspicuity. That just means the scriptures are inherently clear. God did not have a speech impediment. He invented language. He invented language operators, language receptors. God spoke. Very first conversations with Adam in the garden. He's one minute old and he's having adult conversations with the creator of the universe. Those conversations come with the expectation there would be obedience, and if no obedience, there would be consequences. God spoke, he was understandable. God created language. God wrote his own word to us, not to hide in academic ivory towers, only to be interpreted by the the hoity-toities who got a bunch of degrees. God wrote his word to be understood by his people. So we believe in the doctrine of the clarity of Scripture. What I want to do for the remainder of our time this morning is uh, use a a scholarly Roman Catholic critique of perspicuity as a way to think through the arguments that would be made for any cult leader, for Islam, for the Mormons or the Jehovah's Witnesses, or even again, a little closer to home, traditionalists or confessionalists. That is, those who would say, my tradition rules, and the Bible kind of submits to it, serves it. Or, uh, my confession is the guardrails and authority, and and throughout history, you'd have to pick which confession you were talking about. They disagree with each other. But the arguments I'm going, to, I'm going to lay out from one particular book uh, from a, a Roman Catholic scholar by the name of Casey Chalk. And he converted to Catholicism after being a seminary student in a Reformed uh, Protestant seminary. Um, and, and he wrote a book. I almost, I took the cover off because I was carrying this around reading it. And a big cover in big letters says, the Obscurity of Scripture. That's the title of the book. And it is a critique, open, academic, scholarly, well-researched critique of the Bible's clarity. And so, uh, at one point, just carrying it around to my kids' baseball games and on trips on airplanes, uh, somebody recommended, well, just take the dust jacket and flip it around. So I did. It's like all white on the inside. I just kind of hide this book. It did create some conversations. Uh, One conversation on an airplane, a man said, hey, what are you reading? I was like, oh, it's a bad book. I don't believe it. (laughs) And he said, well, what is it? And then we just had an hour-long gospel conversation. So, at any rate, don't buy this. Don't read it. I'll just quote some for you. What's interesting about this book He is obviously lifting up the authority of the Roman Catholic Church as the interpretive grid and the final say on what you should believe. But this is saying the quiet thing out loud. 
in, in one sense. Um, the reason the church must be that authority is because the Bible isn't good enough at being that authority. And what's interesting, um, what he, the, the claim is what the, what the Bible is unable to do, be a clear, authoritative proclamation of everything you need to know, uh, the Catholic Church claims its ability to do. And you might already be asking, well, who interprets the Catholic Church? Um, is the Catholic Church claiming for itself clarity that it denies the Bible? And the answer to that is, is yes. Uh, tragic irony in the book, uh, Scott Hahn, who is another Protestant convert to Roman Catholicism, in the preface tells us that the book's author, Casey Chalk, makes himself abundantly clear. <laughs> The obscurity of Scripture. But the author was really clear about it. That's just ironic. One of the arguments is that disagreement about the Bible must be curtailed by an authority outside the Bible. And you've heard this argument before. Well, good men disagree. So who's to say? What's the answer to that question? The Bible is to say. God is to say. Now, we may not come to a similar understanding of that answer, but at its foundation, you must say the Bible is the authority. God has spoken. It behooves us to get after what God has said. The argument here is that um, disagreement about the Bible proves that the Bible's not clear. But, but that is blame shifting. That is blaming the Bible for human error our error, our interpretive error. There are so many different views, therefore the Bible can't be trustworthy on its own. We need an authority. The other books, the cult leader, uh, the, the Watchtower Tract Society, uh, the Quran, or in the case of Roman Catholicism, the Pope and the Magisterium. Listen to what Chalk says about this. If Scripture is not clear, that's the wrong quote. That's an even worse quote. We'll get to that one. If the Bible is given by a truthful and omnipotent God as an internally consistent and perspicuous text precisely for the purpose of revealing to humans correct beliefs, practices, and morals, then why is it that the presumably sincere Christians to which it has been given cannot read it and come to common agreement about what it teaches? The fundamental argument of this book and one of the fundamental arguments of a Roman Catholic apologist against Protestantism you'll hear it again and again and again, is you have denominations. Protestantism is scattered and splintered across the world, and you can't even count how many different Christian groups there are that aren't Catholic. Therefore, the Bible's the problem. That's the argument. Why are there different understandings? Chalk says, well, there, there's no good answer to the fact that different people have different interpretations, um, except they need the interpretive authority of the Catholic Church. I would suggest to you there are lots of good answers. Why do people disagree about the Bible? Uh, I, I have one, two, three, four, five, six listed. Um, earlier I had a list of 20, I tried to boil these down. You could probably come up with lots of other reasons than these. Let me give you six. Why are there different understandings of Scripture? First of all, there's a categorical difference among Bible readers between the regenerate and the unregenerate. If you are not made alive by the Spirit of God, there are realities that will always be foreign to you. 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural man cannot understand the things of God. They're spiritually appraised. That is a categorical inability of a person not indwelt by the Holy Spirit to grapple with truth in the ways that God intends. That doesn't mean that an unbeliever can't diagram a sentence and figure out the historical context and word meanings. There are plenty of unbelievers who could tell you, the Bible says salvation is by grace alone through faith alone. Here's the texts. But there is an understanding of that that is in keeping with salvation that is unavailable to the unregenerate. This Holy Spirit is required categorically. Right? This is uh, what Paul says in 1 Corinthians about the Jews in his day who read the Old Testament as with a veil over their eyes. There's a blindness. And when the veil drops, and I love what Jesus says about this in the Gospel of Luke, when, when one of the scribes steeped in the Old Testament 
comes to faith in Jesus, they're able to pull out treasures new and old. That's a good incentive for us to teach kids the Bible even before they know the Lord. Is there a categorical uh, blindness, 1 Corinthians 2, 14? Yes, and yet you're instilling a treasure trove of the knowledge of God's word that will one day bear fruit should they come to faith. But that first fundamental barrier requires belief produced by the Holy Spirit. A second reason people disagree is just the limitations of knowledge. Just the limitations of knowledge. Again, we're all students. We all need to grow. There are objective limitations, limitations outside of me. Uh, the Bible was written in languages I did not know. In fact, Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic, as written in the Bible, um, are not spoken today. I know Hebrew is still spoken today, but it's changed over time. If you've ever been curious to see how language changes, um, just watch social media for the last, oh, I don't know, about 10 minutes. <laughs> Vocabulary changes, we're always adding new words to the dictionary. Try to read Beowulf, that's in English, right? In a very short span of time, the English language has changed. Over thousands of years, language changed. Um, so even for modern Hebrew readers, there's a, a big gap to bridge linguistically. And for us who don't know Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic, uh, there's gaps to cross in knowledge. Uh, idioms are important. Um, if, if someone is said to be long in the nose, um, we're not talking about a feature, we're talking about a disposition of anger. How would you know that unless you grew up in that culture and, and, and just sort of knew those things by common usage? We can read words and not understand what the words mean because they are idiomatic. Um, so these things just take time, they take research. We need to get to culture and, and customs and, and sometimes uh, monetary um, devices. So how much is a talent? I don't know. Got to go find out how much a talent is worth. Um, how long is a cubit? I don't, I don't know how long a cubit is. Well, the, the Bible's very clear. The ark was so many cubits big. That still doesn't tell me how big it was until I know what a cubit is. Uh, they're just things to overcome. Those are natural objective limitations. We need to learn geopolitics, the hor historical settings of when things were written. Uh, we're separated by time, distance, geography, topography, culture, idiom, expression, all of those things we need to learn. There are also subjective limitations. That, that has more to do with me, uh, which is I, I need to read more. Why don't I understand my Bible as well as I should? I, I just haven't read it enough. Keep reading. The Bible gets clearer and clearer and clearer, not because it has changed, but because you have accessed it more. You keep reading, keep studying, make more observations, get the big picture, get the details. Listen, you make Bible study a lifetime quest. We need to grow in our attention span. We need to grow in our diligence. And then we come to other subjective limitations like literacy, uh, the, the learning of languages, uh, education level, analytical skills, uh, tools at our disposal. In the English language today, we have more research tools to get at what is clear in God's word than anybody has ever experienced ever before. Uh, sometimes when the pile of wonderful research tools is so big and daunting and overwhelming, we don't use it. You think back to when books were really, really expensive, hard to come by, nobody had them, and somebody had one really good help. I was just reading this last week about the history of concordances. That's kind of weird. But people that took the time to compile, without computers, every use of the word and in the Bible. <laughs> wow. Somebody spent their life doing that work. I get to benefit. Zach Can, I'm looking at Zach Can right now. He's nodding because Zach Can is writing the, the Doe Dictionary. He's writing the Doe Theological Dictionary. He's writing the Doe Concordance. He's <laughs> translating. I mean, it's just endless what, what has to be produced for a language that doesn't have the Bible yet. That's been done for us in English, such tremendous tools. So there are things for us to overcome. And then spiritual maturity, personally, is a limitation. My own spiritual maturity will govern my access to the clear Word of God. 
Uh, we'll, we'll talk about how sin obscures things in, in just a moment. Well, no, we're going to do that right now. That's the next thing. Turn to Hebrews chapter 6. We can be sin blinded. Chapter 5, verse 12, the writer to Hebrews says, By this time you ought to be teachers, <laughs> and you have need again for someone to teach you elementary principles. You've come to need milk and not solid food. Everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he's an infant. Solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity. There was something that the writer to Hebrews wanted to talk to his readers about. Something God wanted to convey through this letter. That immaturity in the readers had stumped, stagnated. And particularly, the maturity was about uh, the training of discerning of good and evil. Where does that come? Verse 14 of chapter 5. By practice. There is a maturity in the Christian life that comes by the practice of putting into place the discernment of good and evil, which implies the heeding of those things, that allows you to dive deeper into what has always been true and clear in God's Word. The negative side of this is just recognize when you're tangled up in sin, when you're not doing a good job discerning good and evil, when you're not in the habit and practice of keeping a clean conscience before the Lord, you, you can't expect that the Word of God is going to be your delight and that it will ring true in your heart with all of its precision and clarity. Sin obscures. There is, of course, the, the, the great big problem of satanic blinding. Here's a, what are we on? One, two, three, four. We'll call this the fourth category. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4 calls Satan the, the, the God of this world who blinds the minds of unbelievers so they can't see the glory of God in the face of Christ. They can't apprehend the gospel. Gospel's clear in God's word. Why can't unbelievers see it? Satan, he has a vested interest in keeping people from truth, particularly saving truth. And then for anybody in Christ, here's a fifth category. I would just call this layers of unbelief. And what I mean by that is resistance to things the Word of God clearly says because I don't want to stomach that right now. I, 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 don't, I don't want to get to where the Bible wants to take me. I don't know if you've ever felt that way. If you've dug in your heels in resistance, you come to something in God's Word and you go, oh, I don't like that. I'll turn back to my favorite passage, which doesn't indict my heart. I remember very clearly reading Psalm 37, 4, and it says, wait on the Lord. And I said out loud in my living room, holding my cup of coffee, Bible in my hand, I hate waiting. <laughs> just impatient. Whoa. I, I just said out loud that I hate doing something God commands. Mm. <laughs> my unbelief robbed me of things God, God's word had for me. And we have layers of unbelief. We're, we're mixed up creatures. Listen, I, I, I just don't like the Matthew 18 process. I can't stomach the doctrine of hell. I just can't think about it for very long. So we'll just go with universalism. I don't know if you, I, I've felt that way. There are things that are just hard for me to grapple with and I'm ready to dismiss. Statements about sexuality it may just seem unnice in our culture, in our day. That's not a categorical unbelief necessarily. It doesn't make someone an unbeliever. It, it's just a recognition that we all have unbelief in the mix. And the problem is not the Bible. The problem's me. The Bible's clear. And then a sixth, we'll, we'll end uh, this section with this last category. There are religious and cultural and theological interpretive grids we all have. I believe that the way we typically do theology is not the way theology should be done. The way we typically do theology 
is I hear the gospel, I get saved, I'm in a community of believers, and what they believe, I just glom onto. I just take that. That's, that's what it is. And then you start to find people that are tracking well with the Lord, and their lives are compelling, and so their doctrine is believable. And you keep reading your Bible. And, and over time, you, you, you take what you have been given uh, through discipleship, uh, through teaching, in whatever context you were in, and, and then that comes up against the Bible. In one sense, that body of things you believe that was just sort of given to you becomes an interpretive grid for the scriptures. And I don't know if you've had this experience. I know I have. I come to a Bible verse that disagrees with that blob of material that I was given. What wins? In many cases for me, the Bible lost because my Romans professor said, or my discipler told me, or the Christian community I was with believed, fill in the blank. And that interpretive grid or that theological system, that ism, whatever it is, sits over the Bible and wins. And friends, that's not how we should do theology. I think that's how we all did theology. Ideally, what should we do? Read your Bible, read your Bible, read your Bible, read your Bible. Read it again, read it some more, read it again. And then you apply what we call hermeneutics. It's just a fancy word to, say, uh, word to describe how do we understand texts. What set of rules do we use to glean meaning? And we're committed to this. Any passage of the Bible has a single meaning, and what we want is the author's meaning. We want authorial intent. We want to know what did God mean by what he said. And what God meant by what he said is synchronous with what the human author meant by what the human author said. God doesn't circumvent the human author in the writing of Scripture to mean something different, mysterious, deep, dark that we get around the meaning of the words. And so we apply to the Bible the rules applied to understand language. Again, God's the inventor of language. You try to apply some of the funny hermeneutics Christians do to the Bible, to your IRS form, and you'll go to jail. <laughs> In other words, we, we apply the normal rules of language to the Scriptures so that the Scripture has the authority, not our blob of interpretive grid and systems and theology and favorite theologians and our church community overruling the Scriptures. And we do all of that with the humility that says, I'm just one guy, I, I want to understand my Bible. It, listen, it, that blob, I, I don't want to totally disparage it, it's helpful to have guardrails. It, it's helpful to have a set of, okay, we're Trinitarian, salvation is by grace alone through faith alone, I know you're new at this. But still, even in those guardrails, we want to be pointing people to the final authority of the Scriptures. And it's really helpful when you're discipling somebody, when you're evangelizing, when you're talking to somebody about truth, to open the Bible, turn it around and say, don't trust me, here's God's word. So we have to get past our religious, cultural, theological, interpretive grids, preconceived ideas, and perspectival bias. We all have perspectives. We all have different views. And we can believe very strongly in our perspectives. Uh, I, I do a social experiment. You may have heard me ask this question. Would you rather be trapped in a phone booth with a cockroach or with a wasp? And there's a right answer to that question from our various perspectives. And you're laughing already because mostly the women will say, I'd rather be trapped in a phone booth with a wasp. Am I right? Chris says no. Okay. My social experiment's falling apart right before my very eyes. Anyway, we'll leave that aside. Perspectives are important and strongly held. The, the typical answer that I've received is, well, cockroaches are just icky, I'd rather. Anyway, our perspectives have to be jettisoned when the Bible disagrees with them. We want God's bias. We want God's perspective. To recognize that we have our perspectives and our preferences and our traditions and our backgrounds those can be helpful, but they are not authoritative. The Bible must win. And that takes work. So in answer to Casey Chalk's question, uh, 
What, what, what's the answer to so many people having different views? That must mean the Bible's the problem. No, the Bible's not the problem. We're the problem. We're the problem. We work at it. The Bible's the true source, it's the answers, it's the authority. And the great news about the Bible is it is accessible. The meaning of the scripture is accessible through language, words, grammar, context, reading, and study. In fact, we, we give away at the information table to new visitors, uh, How Readest Thou by J.C. Ryle. Are we still giving that one away? Is that the giveaway book? If you don't have that, pretend like you're a visitor and go get one. Or go to the book table and buy one. Um, But it is a great introduction to allowing God's word to speak for itself and the discipline that that takes over a lifetime and the benefits and the fruit. The great thing about the Bible, it is a book not to be exhausted by any one interpreter in a lifetime of study. And yet it's understandable to a child. The way to heaven is clear. The character of God is clear. Expectations for living are clear. Uh, Get over the fundamental barrier of unbelief by the power of the Holy Spirit and you are set free to hear from God. One of the arguments that Casey Chalk makes is the scriptures ought to unify. And you'll hear this from Roman Catholics. Christians are not unified, therefore the scriptures are the problem. In fact, he calls it perspicuity's failure, all the fragmentation in Christendom. He gives in an example uh, the American chattel slave practice in the 19th century. He he said, well, you know, you had southern Protestants saying slavery was okay. You had northern Protestants saying slavery was not okay. And they preached sermons at and against each other, both from texts of Scripture. Problem? Problem? Bible. Bible's not clear. Uh, no, that, that wasn't the problem. In fact, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Again, this blame shift, God must be at fault. He, he must have had a speech impediment. He couldn't communicate clearly. Um, and so you need an interpretive authority like the Catholic Church. Proof, slavery. No, God was clear. Listen to 1 Timothy chapter 1, just by way of example. The law is not made, verse 9, for a righteous person, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for ungodly and sinners, unholy and profane, for father killers and mother killers, for murderers and immoral men and homosexuals and New American Standard says kidnappers. The word there for kidnappers is andropodistes. It was the practice of stealing people and making them slaves and then selling them, trading them, buying them. The the entire European slave trade that, that plied its trade from the African continent to the North American continent is a violation of this text. The Bible couldn't be more clear. Paul lists andropodistes right up there with those who had murdered their fathers and their mothers, the immoral, the ungodly, and the whole list. Paul's point there in 1 Timothy 1 is to say, I'm chief of sinners. Put me in that category, right? As every Christian who examines his own heart says before the Lord, no, Paul, you weren't the chief. I'm the chief. I know me. But you notice what Paul lists there. He, he lists the American, European, chattel, slave trade in that list of vices, supreme vices. And of course, this is a reflection of Exodus 21, which prohibited the very same thing. You think, well, weren't there slaves in the Bible? Yeah. Um, sometimes in a sinful way, but you have to recognize first century slavery was not uh, you know, American, European, chattel slavery either. Those are two different enterprises. And what happened in North America, in our own history, by God's assessment, was wicked and evil. And so the problem was not with the Bible. This could have been easily discovered. The problem is with men who want to use a Bible misunderstood, misapprehended to defend and protect sinful practices. Don't blame the Bible for man's sin. And by the way, the answer to that is not, you need a pope. (laughs) 
You need a cult leader. You need the Quran. You need to add to God's word. God's word isn't enough to, to break down this vice. You need something else. And anytime you suggest that the Bible needs some other authority, you're actually taking away from the scriptures. Again, subtraction by addition, subtraction by obliteration. Chalk says, how much disunity will Protestants allow before they admit that the Bible is incapable of producing it? (laughs) And at one level, that's an insightful question. I mean, how many more denominations and fragmentations do there have to be before we all just raise our hands and go, okay, you're right, Roman Catholics, the Bible can't produce unity. (laughs) Or it hasn't. How much is it going to take? The problem with that argument, although it, it, it may sound compelling at its face, would be something like a, a red light principle. Traffic light turns red, cars are supposed to stop before they get into the intersection. And you come to an intersection where you know, people have been pushing those boundaries. The, the light turns yellow, yeah, it was kind of orange, you know, really red, well, you know, nobody's coming. And cars plow into intersections and people die. And it happens again and again and again and again. At what point are you going to admit the light's not red? (laughs) At what point are you going to admit that red lights don't work? At what point are you going to admit that the light is broken? Listen, the problem's not with the light. The problem is with the people. That's true in terms of an interpretive authority. The the red light principle tells us you don't fix the problem (laughs) with some other color. (laughs) some additional beacon. The the, the problem is with the people. What is the Roman Catholic solution to fragmentation? We will be the interpretive authority. Uh, Quote here comes from Archbishop Fulton Sheen, uh, who uh, lived from 1895-1979, wrote authoritative uh, Catholic works. He says, it is the Roman Catholic Church which makes the Bible's meaning clear. If you get rid of the living voice, and by living voice, he means the Catholic Church, the book becomes a dead letter. That's the view. Uh, Another uh, Roman Catholic scholar said outside the Roman Catholic Church, Scripture cannot be understood. Another argument that Casey Chalk in this book, The Obscurity of Scripture, makes is that the authority for interpretation either has to be located in the church, the Catholic church, or in the private individual. Uh, He he calls it the the private judgment principle. And either it's going to be safeguarded by the experts, traditions, scholastics, confessions, the magisterium, the pope, the modern day prophet, the cult leader, whatever. It's either going to be located there, that's where the authority is, or the authority is with the individual. Listen, that that is a specious argument. It's not one or the other. In fact, neither has the authority. You do not have the interpretive authority. Where does the authority lie? In God's word. The argument from Catholics that that says, well, you either have the Pope or everyone did what was right in his own eyes uh, is not the right answer. The authority is located in the word of God itself. And what comes with the word of God for its readers and interpreters, is divine accountability. This is so critical for us to understand. Remember the book of Deuteronomy, that sermon from Moses before the Israelites enter into the promised land. You must be careful to read and to heed, to listen and to do. God's people will be held accountable for how they took God's word. It came with the expectation of obedience and the enforcement of accountability. You're not free to do whatever you want with God's word. Any external clarification of God's word lacks the authority and life-giving power of the word itself. At best, commentaries, councils, creeds, confessions, traditions, at best they can shine light on what the word of God says. They can help us see it. They can safeguard us from, from running amok very quickly into our own thoughts. But that is not where the authority is. The authority is in the Word of God, and accountability comes with it. The reality is that everyone is under the Word of God, 
In the end, no one will sit in judge of it. No council, no creed, no confession, no set of bishops, no pope. We are judged by the word of God. Martin Luther said it this way, the scripture only can be the final judge or rule in matters of religion. We will stop there. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the truth of your word. Again, we thank you for its power. We pray that we would not assent to the final authority of your word of God without making it our daily bread. We pray that we would be people of the book, that we as a, as a discipline, as a delight, as a course of habit, and as an insatiable appetite would devour your word because we want to know you, to be conformed to your image, to be like you, to be pleasing to you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.